Hey everyone, today I've got for you Dr. Christy Huff, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her in case you don't already know her. Christy Huff, MD, FACC, is a cardiologist who resides in Fort Worth, Texas. She attended medical school at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, where she graduated Alpha Omega Alpha in 2001. She completed an internal medicine residency at Washington University in St. Louis in 2004. Her cardiology training was completed at UT Southwestern in 2008 with a focus in advanced cardiovascular imaging and non-invasive cardiology. She was in private practice as a cardiologist in Fort Worth from 2008 to 2011. Following the birth of her child, she made the decision to become a stay-at-home mom. And one thing about Christy is that um, she is also a benzodiazepine survivor. So welcome, Christy. Thanks, Jocelyn. It's good to be here. Good. I'm glad that you could do this interview. Um, and just to kind of also let people know, so Christy works with the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, or BIC, at, at benzoinfo.com, and you are the Director of Public Relations, correct? Um, I'm just one of the directors, you're yes. Just, you're, you're an A director at BIC, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I know that there are many hands there sort of behind the scenes helping to keep it running and and keep it going and um and you also kind of work here and there with um the nonprofit i work with the alliance for benzodiazepine best practices and we'll get into that a little bit later but first um i just wanted you to tell us uh, your history your benzo story and how that you know really led to um your work now with this nonprofit so um, yeah, you can just start off wherever. Sure. So I was prescribed Xanax uh, for it was for an insomnia related to a health crisis. I had severe dry eye syndrome. Uh, this was in August of 2015. And after a few weeks of taking the Xanax nightly uh, just for, for sleep, because my eye condition was really painful and kept me awake at night, um, I started to have some really weird symptoms. I started to have a tremor. And I started to have some anxiety during the day that I hadn't really had before. And I kind of went on this, um, I guess, medical mystery tour, you know, with my doctors trying to figure out what was going on. They ran all these tests. This took a like, couple of months. And meanwhile, I just kept getting sicker and sicker. And, um, you know, all the tests came back normal. And I finally, I just got on the internet and I Googled Xanax because that was really the only medication I was taking at the time. And I thought, well, that we really haven't investigated this. And I found the website Benzo Buddies, which is a support form for Benzo survivors. And everything that they were describing on there sounded exactly like what was happening to me. So, you know, I, I read through all the threads and it was obvious you've developed dependence on Xanax and you're having something called interdose withdrawal, which is where the half-life is so short that I was starting to get withdrawal symptoms in between doses. And um, so once I figured that out, I had to uh, figure out how I was going to get off this medication because it was obviously making me um, sick. And so I went back to my, the doctors who had prescribed it and they, um, basically said, no, this can't be happening. You're not dependent. Um, you can just stop the drug. And, uh, you know, I knew that wasn't going to work because, you know, I had tried to actually taper off on my own and I, I was having these severe symptoms that honestly weren't even compatible with life. Like I was, I couldn't breathe. My heart was pounding. Um, muscles were seizing up and it, it was just, it was horrible. Um, so I had read about the Ashton Manual online, and I took that to a local psychiatrist. And um, thankfully, um, you know, it took me a few weeks to find um, doctors, a doctor that was willing to listen to me. But thankfully, he helped me transition over to Valium, you know, as, as outlined in the Ashton Manual. Um, and the rationale for that is the, um, you know, the long half-life of the um, drug will help cover those interdose withdrawal symptoms and, you know, make it easier to taper off. And so then, you know, I started on this taper process 
And when I started, I did, I thought, well, maybe three to six months top to get off, you know, using the Valiant taper. And that's not what happened. It took me over three years, uh, almost three years and three months to do the Valiant taper. And I was extremely sick and disabled the entire time. So I'm wow. right now a, a year off from benzodiazepines as of March 15th. Yeah, that's, that's so, such, I mean, three years is a long time to taper. And I imagine during that time, you were still trying to be a mother on some level. Um, what did you do? Was your husband able to help out? Did you have help? And, you know? Yeah, so that was extremely difficult because my daughter was, she was four and a half at the time this happened. She was just starting her last year of preschool and I ended up having to hire a nanny uh, for the first couple of years because I couldn't drive, I couldn't cook for the family. You know, my husband, he's a radiologist and he, you know, works Monday through Friday, sometimes weekends as well. So I, you know, he couldn't take take on as much of the child care as I would have liked. And so we had we had to hire a, a nanny to to help out. And um yeah, and the, I mean, my mom helped us a lot as well. It was just, it was wow. devastating because I was totally incapacitated. Yeah, oh, that's good that your mom could help out too. I, I totally get where you're, where you're coming from. My daughter was really close to the same age. She was um, starting her first year of preschool. She was about three, three and a half. And um, yeah, that that's so painful, you know, mm -hmm. on on such a different level. I think those of us who are going through withdrawal and our mothers <laughs> like it's just pain on a whole other level because you can't be there for your kids um, um it was it was awful and i just i had so much guilt you know yeah. it's like you're right you just couldn't be there for her in the way that i wanted to be yeah yeah are you able to be there more for her now over this past year have things gotten better oh definitely so at the very end of my taper, I was pretty much bedridden, couldn't do anything. And, and now I'm back to being able to function through a normal day so I can drive her to school and back. You know, I can participate in daily life, fix meals, things like that. And so, and yeah, I'm much more like with it and, you know, able to carry on a conversation with her, just things that I wasn't able to do even a, a year ago. And so I really feel like in many respects, I'm, I'm back. Yeah. That's good. And I know you'll continue to keep coming back, you know, year after year, it'll just get better and better. Um, when, when you were like really bad, um, would you just share with us some of the, the main symptoms that you were experiencing with your Valium taper? Sure. So I actually documented all these and I, I wrote down almost, it's 79. I think 79 was the, the final count that I bothered to document. Uh, but I would say that, and I did all that on my, my Twitter account just to, you know, take my story public. But I'd say the worst things that I experienced were, um, you know, it really messed up my, my memory, my cognitive function. Like I would just forget how to do things. Like I would forget how to put in my contact lenses. I'd just like, be staring at them and be like, what, what is this? You know, <laughs> how do I do this? You know, it, I was so dizzy towards the end that I couldn't even stand. My muscles were so weak that, you know, wet laundry felt heavy when I was trying to transfer it from the washer to the dryer. My, my heart pounded relentlessly. Um, I mean, it, the, the symptom list just went on and on and on. And it was just all together. It was just this devastating syndrome that kept me from life, basically. Mm -hmm. And like, like some others out there like myself and um, even though you were going through so much during that time is when you joined the benzo info correct the yes i did mm -hmm. uh, i joined them in 2016 that was actually right after they had um formed they approached me about writing my story mm -hmm. for their website and so i did that and then later on um they needed a, a third director and I took that spot. I think that was in early 2017. And, you know, once I, I joined as director, then my advocacy work really took off. And, and yeah, I was, I was sick in the middle of it. And I, I 
really glad, honestly, that I took that on, but it, because it gave me a sense of purpose and something to kind of distract me from my symptoms and something to look forward to. And so that, that's been really good for me. Um, you know, it, it was similar for me, like you, it's on the one hand, I found it so helpful to have a purpose um, in the midst of this suffering, right? That you have a purpose, that you have something that you feel is empowering that you can do about this. But at the same time, when you're a mom, again, <laughs> it's like you you only have so much energy, right? Right, right. And it's so hard because it's like you want to be able to give it to your family and to your kids. And in some ways you still can't. So then in other ways, you're spending that time and energy on this advocacy work and on these helping other people. And it can be, it can be a tricky balance and it can be exhausting, even more exhausting than I would say your average benzo person going through withdrawal, you know? Yes. Yes, I agree. And I, I definitely, and I still have to face that decision on a daily basis. Like, okay, I need to give this time to my family. And of course they're going to be my number one priority, but I also want to you know, arrange a little time for advocacy as well. And I mean, it worked out pretty well. Once my daughter started elementary school, she was gone for six hours during the weekdays. And, you know, that's the time that I would devote to advocacy and, yeah. you know, it's kind of basic life tasks and try to spend more time with her whenever she was home. That's good. Yeah, you can hopefully kind of compartmentalize this a little more like that. Um, and really, you've done um, some, you guys have done some great work um, in the past few years. I know you had that uh, Lisa Ling CNN um, episode on benzodiazepines that you helped uh, her to do and get people to interview and things like that. And that was really great. And um, I know you wrote, you did end up writing that, that piece for Vic, which I believe has been picked up in a few different places. Um, um, online with different doctor sites or things like that, right? Yeah, I've written a couple of pieces. I've, I've published quite a few works on kevinmd.com mm -hmm. um, and also Doximity and, and, uh, and then generally they make their way back to the, the BIC site. We publish them there as well. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, that's really great because the KevinMD and Doximity are sites that other healthcare professionals read. And so that, that's been a way of getting the benzo cause out in front of the, the medical community. And is that like your main goal right now at BIC is to really just sort of educate the public as much as possible about this whole benzodiazepine problem? Yes, that's our official mission is to educate about the adverse effects of prescribed benzos. Mm -hmm. and, and we, um, and yes, we're basically trying to reach the general public or trying to reach patients that have been harmed already and you know but also reach the general public so that we're hopefully preventing others from being harmed and and also reach the medical profession as well so it's really all comers mm -hmm. and i think that really helps having you there as a medical professional because that just tends to lend more <laughs> right <laughs> helps bridge the, the gap there, so. Right, because sometimes when it's just patients speaking, unfortunately, they don't tend to listen as much. <laughs> right, and that's why I've been really public with my story, because I, I was hoping that I would have a little more credibility as a physician, and in general, you know, I, I think I have. Yeah, that's good, and I know that, like, Nicole, who is a, a PA, which mm -hmm. she, she recently did a, just a really great video about, um, addressing Jordan Peterson's whole kind of experience that he recently has gone through with, uh, you know, benzodiazepine withdrawal and stuff like that. And so she did a really great job of addressing that in a way that was, um, I think, uh, digestible for both patients and maybe right. medical professionals who might be watching. And she also writes for Kevin MD as well. She's published a couple of pieces there. So it's, it's just been really a great way to get the word out. Yeah, I think you guys have just taken off so much and it's been so great. And I'm also just uh, impressed that you've also uh, extended yourself also then to combine uh, BIC's efforts with the Alliance um, in, in whatever ways that, that we can to sort of come together and work on these similar goals. Um, because obviously at the Alliance, the goal is to get more research done um, to affect 
really the the way that doctors are trained or the way that doctors prescribe these um, on a level like on a governmental level or on yeah you know just kind of just a slightly different focus but definitely in alignment with what's going on at right, the- right yeah as I understand y'all are y'all's focus is more on you know the healthcare professional mm-hmm. side of things and influencing their prescribing habits and hopefully just spreading more awareness about how to taper and, and of course we that's our goal too but we're also i think y'all are focusing solely on the the medical community aspect of it mm-hmm. yeah and definitely a huge part of that focus is getting more research done to right, right. present to the fda right because it's kind of hard to get them to change their advice or anything like that if you don't have new research so yes i've been you know told by them specifically that you know you have to have a a case with new research or they're mm-hmm. they're just not going to look at it because there was always already a petition filed back in 2010 that they rejected yeah i remember that <laughs> so if we if we can get some if you guys can get some new research that would be awesome yeah that is the goal although i know you've done your own um you've had your own efforts with regard to that on some level with i believe pro publica um, is that correct? And, and, or with trying to get people to, um, contact the FDA and, and list all of their adverse effects that they're having, right. And to have like yeah, a so we, couple of years back and it, it's still actually on our website. We were asking people to file an FDA med watch report and this is still good. You can file an FDA med watch report at any time and actually anybody that has been harmed should do this and it's it's not just for benzodiazepines it's any drug any adverse effect but you really need to take the time to to fill out this report because that will go into the fda's database and then you know like when you guys get this new research um the the fda can go back into that database and compare you know these new reports um with the research and so it, it it's there's always a good time to fill out the report it's always going to add good information Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know I did when you brought that to my attention. I was like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even know that. I had no clue that that was a thing. And so, um, yeah, I was glad I could contribute to that. Yeah, there's a link on our website at benzoinfo.com. And I believe the Alliance has it on their website as well, where people can access, yeah. access it. Yeah, right. report. Yeah. And I've always said, you know, if, if anybody wants to fill out a report, you know, I'm glad to answer questions about it. I've, I've helped people fill out a number of them and, you know, I know the, the nuances of the report, but it, it's pretty simple. So don't be intimidated if anybody out there is listening and would like to file their report. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything else that people can do to help out with any efforts that you're currently working on or anything that you're particularly excited about that you're working on right now at Vic? Um, mainly we're just, of course, things have kind of slowed down a bit because of the, <laughs> the COVID epidemic here. Uh, but, you know, we're always being approached by the media. So one thing people can do is get on our website and there's a, a media volunteer form where we basically enter your information at a database and anytime the media um, sends us a story request, you know, we can, we can match that story with you know, a harmed patient who's willing to share their story that we think would be a good fit for the article. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's something that people can do. Um, okay. That's good to know. I know you guys reached out to me last year um, and I was able to do a news interview for the local news station here. And that was, yeah, that was really good. Cause then I got picked up in other places and, you know, um, so it, it makes a huge difference just, even like one story that we can get out of there because yeah and then Janice has also started this media accuracy team and uh, there may I'd have to ask her but there may be more room for people on that but um, it's a pretty small time commitment but anytime there's a, any sort of article in the news that is misusing the word addiction in relation to benzodiazepines then you know she has a team of people that will email the um, journalist and just ask respectfully to um, clarify the difference between addiction and dependence. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. another way people can help. Yeah, that's so important. That's something I think that we were working on a lot <laughs> since the beginning, you know. Um, right. I mean, it's just, it's a constant problem. And anytime we get any sort of 
media requests, you know, we have to be very specific with the journalists, like, hey, this is not addiction we're talking about, it's physical dependence and mm -hmm. why it's important to make the distinction. And even then, sometimes they just don't listen. Like, I remember you had an interview a little while back. Was it NBC or like Dateline or something? Yeah, it was my infamous Lester Holt NBC. <laughs> and they, I mean, it was only a three minute spot. And so they, they really just put that addiction word up there. And I mean, they never come out, came out and said, oh, sh she's having addiction. But, yeah. you know, it was part, it was in big letters on the screen. And yeah. so it was a little bit different than how we wanted to go but I I still think the piece had some merit and you know I got good feedback from people that it, it raised awareness about the issue so no it was good and I think it just goes to show because like they also interviewed um Dr. Anna Lemke who I Sorry, right. interviewed for the series and she did a good job I mean she was you know yeah, yeah. good about talking about it but boy if they want to give something that focus of addiction they'll just do it and yeah. it it just goes to show like even you, a medical professional who knows how to talk about this, like, you know, it can happen. It just happens to whoever, it doesn't matter. Right, well, they can, you know, they can edit it in the end how they want to and portray it how they want to portray it. So yeah. it's the danger you get into. And that also brings to mind, I know basically you had become a stay-at-home mom by the point that you were prescribed Xanax, correct? Yes, yes. Um, but were you still in touch with uh, friends or colleagues uh, at the time that all of this happened and like do, was there any response from them as far as this situation? Um, I'm trying to think. I mean I know that I ended up seeing you know a rheumatologist friend of mine that had been a colleague from back from the days of my training and you know he was evaluating me for Sjogren's syndrome and I mean the basic and I got a little help from the, you know, the ER physicians that I used to work with whenever I ended up having, you know, this big neurological evaluation for the tremor and I had a lumbar puncture mm. and I had this, a spinal leak and a spinal headache. And I had to, I remember I just called one of the ER doctors um, and just said, Hey, I'm coming in, you know, I, I need help. And, you know, they did a blood patch for me and fixed up my headache, but so I got a little help along the way, I guess, in that regard, but but nobody really knew what was going on with me. And every time I'd min mention, you know, Xanax as possible problems, my doctors, they'd be like, no, 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 you've got something going on, but it's not that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pretty, pretty much what everybody else goes through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like in a way that my story really didn't go much differently, even though I was a physician, just because... Nobody really, um, I, I think probably the only thing that went differently is maybe I got care a little bit faster because I was able to put the puzzle pieces together a little bit faster than the average person, but, and then use some of my contacts to, you know, help me find a physician that was going to be able to help me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, st I still went through a fair amount of suffering just trying to find somebody that would you know, believe that, hey, you've got Xanax dependence and you need to switch over to Valium to taper off. Mm -hmm. That I, I want to say that took about two months, you know, for that whole process. Before you understood what was going on and got the help that you needed? Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it may be longer if you count like all the medical tests that I had and yeah. so I know that, I mean, if you count the time, I, I started getting sick and started the drug in August of 2015, started to get sick beginning of September of 2015. And by October, you know, things were really hitting the fan and I was getting tests. And, you know, finally by, I think late October, early November, I found the psychiatrist and then we switched over to Valium over the span of like six weeks. There was a crossover period. And by the beginning of, um, 2016 that's when I started my Valium taper so basically from the time I started Xanax to the time I started a Valium taper was about six months so that wasn't that that was a long time of messing around and being sick and yeah you know yeah well yeah it takes a while I think and 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 I think part way through your taper you kind of switched didn't you like weren't you dry cutting or trying different things and then you, didn't you switch like a liquid taper or something? Um, during the 
Are you asking about during my Valium taper? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so during the Valium taper, I, I just did the standard cut and hold method in the beginning. So I started out on 15 milligrams of Valium and I just, I tried to follow Ashton at first. She said, um, according to her protocol, I was supposed to cut a milligram for the 15. So I did that. And I mean, it just, it knocked me on my butt. It was terrible. You know, I, I had like intractable nausea. My heart was pounding. I was so sick. And it took me a month to stabilize from that cut. You know, I talked to the my psychiatrist. He was like, no, don't go back. Just, just hold and, you know, stabilize. So I did. And then I went back to doing uh, lower dosage reductions. I was cutting like 0.5 milligrams um, at a time and holding every two weeks at first. And then those started to catch up with me. So then it was like every three to four weeks. And then finally by the middle part of my taper, I think it was around seven and a half milligrams. Um, I just couldn't handle those big cuts anymore. And I, I had looked into micro taper before and it was always pretty um, intimidating because it's, it, it seems pretty complicated just <laughs> looking at it. And um, I saw that there was liquid methods versus scale methods. And I, I just settled on doing the scale method because I, I had a friend that already had a scale and he was done with this taper and he just, you know, he mailed it to me when he was done. And, um, and it just worked out, ended up working out fine for me. And that's what I did for the remaining half of my taper. Oh, okay. So you were able to kind of micro taper a little more off at the end. Yeah, I was, I was basically reducing my do little micro do reductions every one to two days. And I just adjusted my rate or even threw in some holds here and there just according to how I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think it really changed my, um, I guess my overall outcome, but it certainly made the process smoother. Mm -hmm. um, so it just, it was able, I wasn't hit with that, the huge intensity of symptoms mm -hmm. that I was with the cut and hold method. Right. I mean, I, I started off doing cut and hold, but it was with Ativan. So I was still doing, I, I was still experiencing the inner dose withdrawals because I didn't know as much. But I mean, the one thing about cut and hold is you, you do at least kind of have this recovery that you experience, or at least I did. It's like when you cut, it is, it knocks you back, but then you start to kind of get better and better and like a little better. And then you're like, okay, it's time for another cut. And so you do kind of experience that that upswing a little bit at least and you can right. tell okay you know it is I am getting a little bit better whereas with micro tapering it's you don't have that knock you back kind of a experience but it, but it's just sort of like this consistent yeah, not I, bad withdrawal but definitely withdrawal you know yeah you like always feel bad and you never quite know like where you are with the cutting process like sometimes it just sort of piles up on you and you're like where did that come from you know yeah all of a sudden all those weeks of micro tapering hit and you're like whoa okay <laughs> maybe it's time to take a break <laughs> yeah i can definitely relate to that <laughs> um yeah, so, I don't miss those days at all <laughs> no Oh my gosh, no. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people reach out to you um, in different ways, you know, just because you're there. And, um, and I'm sure that you, like me, in a lot of ways, you just hear a lot of the, the ugly, gory stuff that's going on in um, the withdrawal, you know, community. And um, that can also make being an advocate really hard. <laughs> oh, it is. Oh. I mean, it's, it's so hard to not get burned out. And in a way I have to, you know, protect myself from that on a certain level. Like I just, there was a t probably about halfway through my taper. I was just like, I can't go into the benzodiazepine support groups anymore. It is just so triggering and so awful. Um, you know, but with that being said, I, um, you know, I try not to turn anybody away if anybody, you know, writes me, um, you know, want to tell me their story. I, I always try to respond back. Now, I can't always give, you know, specific medical advice. I'm not, I'm not their doctor, but, you know, I at least try to hear people out. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, it's, it's hard. It is. It is. Because you've been there yourself. So your heart aches for every single person. But you also have to heal yourself right and you're still healing and so that's yeah it. yeah I've really been very intentional this year about setting boundaries for myself so you know I 
there's only certain hours or times of the day when I check my email or re respond to those types of messages. And that, that's really helped me because, you know, before when I was during my taper, I was so attached to social media and the internet because literally that's, you know, I can get up out of bed and mm -hmm. I couldn't do the normal things that I would be doing to um, keep myself occupied. And so it was almost like with this 24 seven onslaught of these, you know, of, in the world, I guess. And now I'm trying to, I guess, get back to more of a normal life and try to put some boundaries around that. But I'm, I still want to be involved, I guess. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Um, well, so as you continue forward and, you know, do doing what you're doing and healing and, um, you know, reaching out in the ways that you are, is there any one thing in particular that just gives you hope for the future of all of this? Um, I would just say that the progress that I've seen um, Vic has made over the past few years, I mean, just it, it amazes me what a handful of um, sick individuals can do, like how much awareness we raise. I mean, obviously, there's still so much more to be done, but you know, just the number of media articles that we've been quoted in and um, the number of um, um, things that we've taken part of, you know, our, our writing, me and Nicole and um, Janice has written some blogs as well and our success with CNN. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Brooke Monk because she almost single-handedly found all these harm patients um, for for the episode and she just did a wonderful job so i would i think all of the work that we've done so far really gives me hope yeah i that's kind of what i call the miracle of the modern internet right is that people who are weak and disabled and a minority can still have such a powerful voice and influence um that's right yeah i mean that's that's great because of I mean, if this had happened like 20 years ago, I'd, nobody would have known about it, you know, but here we are all telling our stories on the internet. Yeah, and, and we didn't. That's the point. People suffered in silence. Right. Nobody knew, and now it's finally getting out there. So. Yeah, I mean, this was all still there, you know, it's just now that it's, now we can get it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know you are on, on Twitter, so uh, you're you're updating and, and, and kind of on there. So if anybody wants to follow, I think it's, is it Christy Huff, MD? Yeah, it's Christy Huff, MD. Okay, yeah, if anybody wants to follow you. And um, anyway, I well, this has just been a really good conversation. I just love the fact that we relate on so many levels, <laughs> you know, to all this. And um, I really appreciate all the good work that you've done at, at BIC and just, in general and just really getting the work out there and and Brooke and Janice and and Nicole and everyone so thanks for everything that you guys have been doing oh thank you yeah. and uh, thanks for doing this interview I know it's, it's still you know you're still doing the mom thing and we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's crazy and <laughs> So I, I really feel like getting dressed today because I have it in the past several weeks but <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. oh, shoot, I gotta put on makeup and like you know, well, I still wear sweats, you know, but maybe I'll just put on a nice shirt. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Christy. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, and I wish you all the best on everything else that, that you're working on. Oh, well, thank you. It's been great to talk with you, too. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll keep in touch. All right. Sounds good. Okay. See ya. Bye.